Thanks so much for coming out. Um, I love to see that the building is filling up earlier. Please get here um, on time early, week over week, 6 p.m. But this week's guest is an inspiration to myself. Um, he's an inspiration to the community. He's one of Brooklyn's own, the founder of the Brooklyn Bank and a real estate mogul that is homegrown, homebred, and did it from the ground up. Please welcome Mr. Jew Bernard. Thanks so much for being here. I love your t-shirt. Just for camera purposes, can we open that up? This Brooklyn, a, we did it? Brooklyn, we did it. This is actually a shameless plug. I'm having a, par a biggie party on Friday, so. Nice. <laughs> shameless. <laughs> good man, good man. I see, I, see, I see you brought out all of the bros today. Exactly. Blue fire. <laughs> there we go. There we go, Jude. Real estate's a hot topic right now. Very hot, burning. Yeah, hot topic, but you were in it before it got hot. Um, I got into it when it was getting hot. Uh huh. Um, I was in it when it was ice cold, um, lukewarm, and when it's burning up again. So. You know, a few weeks ago we had DJ Envy, and he came and I walked through his entire career. But I noticed 90% of the people who came to hear him speak had nothing to do with DJing, the Breakfast Club, or his celebrity. It was about real estate. And I was shocked. I'm sitting there like, this is, you know, because I took everybody through his career, but when we started talking about real estate is when everybody perked up. And that's when I thought to myself, I need to get a real estate expert in this chair. Yeah, real estate is where it's at, you know. Um, the celebrity, the sports, the entertainment, all that is all good, but like the oldest, oldest uh, form of making wealth in this country has always been real estate, you know. Um, the orange man who will not speak his name in the White House right now, that's where he made his... <laughs> Uh, money. Um, take it back to Alexander Hamilton. You know that's where he made his money. You know that's pretty much it. That's that's where it's at. That's always always going to be. That's the one commodity that you could never make more of is land. Absolutely. So it's always you know supply and demand. How long you been in real estate? Um, I purchased my first property um, on October thirty first, nineteen ninety seven. So yeah. you are 23 years? 23 years in. Wow. Before we get too deep into that, it's important for me because the reason that I do what I do is I want to bring established, very successful people to the table to share their experience, to share their knowledge. But it's just as vitally important to me to show everyone that you're, you're the folk. same as all of us. You put your pants leg on one leg at a time. Where did it all start for you? On the real estate side? No, just in general. Where are you from? Flatbush, Brooklyn, down the block. There L you go. Literally, um, the junction. Haitian descent? Haitian descent. Okay. Exactly. Sac passe. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, first generation, you know, mom's was a hotel. She worked in a hotel, cleaning cleaning rooms. My dad drove a cab. Nothing spectacular, just just the regular come to America, chase a dream. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was about we weren't we weren't poor or not like that. You know, like like we weren't like rap poor. You know how these dudes talk about how poor they were and stuff. But we were, you know, lower middle class. You know, um, five of us, five or six of us. 
depending when it was in a two bedroom apartment at any time. Um, but I just always wanted more. You know? How important was education in your family? Very educated, um, very, very important. Um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, to this day, uh, my dad still says, hey, it's never too late. To, to go back and finish my master's. I actually dropped out of my master's degree yep. at, at some point, but um, education is education is very vital in, in the Haitian community, in the Caribbean community. Um, but the, the funny thing about education is that education is a nonstop process. You know, um, when people think about education, they, they, they typically think about formal school. You go and you get a piece of paper. But, um, you know, this whole journey through life, it's, it's about a constant, constant learning, you know, and um, learning from the people that you interact with, the situations that you're in, um, taking it upon yourself to, to pick up a book, to, um, to take classes, the de development stuff, mm -hmm. you know, so that... Even though I've never um, completed like my master's degree um, or, or s sought out any further higher education, I'm still very much into education. You know, um, I, I've come, I've come to, to this, um, even when I wasn't on the panel, to learn from other people. And that's, that's a form of education. Correct. You know, Correct. Um, one of the biggest uh, things that one of the biggest mistakes I, I feel I've made in my career is never having a mentor. And um, the, thing with, the thing with having a mentor is that they educate you, right? So, so um, I basically had to make every mistake myself and have to learn from them, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, one of the best things you could do um, as a human being is not make every mistake, you know, like the average person learns from their mistakes, but to be uh, to be above average, it's best to learn from other people's mistakes. There you mistakes. go. There you go. So, absolutely. And really quick, um, can all of you guys in the back hear him? Okay, Jude, if if you don't mind, just uh, speak up just a little bit for for those in the back. Okay. Okay. All right. Shout out to the cheap seats. <laughs> We spoke about education, just formally. What does your ex education look like? You, I, I know you stopped, um, you mentioned that, that you stopped going for your master's, you dropped out. Bachelor's. Bachelor's, um, I went to, I graduated from St. John's University. I got my bachelor's in, um, I got my bachelor's in business management. Okay. Um, I did, did pretty well there. Um, I took the the GMAT. I scored in the in the um, one percentile. Okay. So I had you know I could have gone to any school I wanted to. I had already I had already started the entrepreneurial bug, so I didn't want to leave New York City. So I ended up going to St. John's again. Um, and you know halfway through that, you know um, the the whole the whole process of going to um, get get my MBA was just kind of like a backup mm -hmm. in the event that you know um, this entrepreneurship thing didn't work out for me. Um, I was still working at Verizon at that time. Uh, Is Verizon your first job out of school? My first real job. My first and only real f uh, ever. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So mm -hmm. you graduate from St. John's. Ninety five. You got a bachelor's in management? Yep. You go to work for Verizon? I went to work for Verizon in 95 that same year. 95? Yep. At the time that you're at Verizon, had the entrepreneur, at, has the entrepreneurship bug bit you then? Yeah, I was, I was there from the, uh, like, I, I went in there. First thing that I wanted to do um, was I wanted to open a rim shop. Okay. Um, then that kind of never panned out. Then the next thing I was trying to do is have a bar. You know, like that's every, you know that's that's what we all want to do. It'll be cool. You're gonna have a bar. People are gonna come through. You're gonna be the man. It's, it's blah blah blah. And um, it was during the time that I was that I was looking. I was scouting locations for the bars. Is where I um, 
where I learned about like downtown Brooklyn and how hot it was and stuff like that. And that's how I kind of. This is 96, 97? Um, yeah, this is, this is 96. Okay, so you're going somewhere and we're going we're gonna to 100% get to that. But 96, 97, downtown Brooklyn was getting hot? So, um, it's true story. The day that I realized that the game has changed in downtown Brooklyn, I was on the corner of um, of St. James and Fulton, Biggie's block. Yep. Right, and there's about there's about thirty of us outside rolling in the dice game, right? And it's it's crazy, you know. Dudes is out there, and it's it's dudes got blunts, forties. It's just a scene, right? And um, so. That was, that was my thing. I used to roll dice heavy. Anytime you find a dice game, I, I was there. So I'm sitting there, I'm rolling dice, and um, there's about, there's about $1,100 on the floor, and dice is on the floor, and here comes like this 110-pound blonde girl wearing um, a Pratt University T-shirt, no, excuse me, um, sweatshirt, who's jogging with her, with her, eye, with, with her um, headphones on, runs right through the cypher and kicks the dice and just keeps going like nothing happened, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, everybody, everybody was like, had like this deer in headlights thing, like what just happened, right? And it was right then I realized, this is not your hood anymore. Wow. This is her hood. Wow. You know, so it's just like she had the authority there. Like we were the ones encroaching, so um, that was that was when I, I first realized that um, downtown Brooklyn was hot, um, and I had I had not purchased in downtown Brooklyn yet, but that's when um, had you purchased at all? Yeah, I did. I had I had a couple of joints in Queens. This all while working at Verizon. All while working at Verizon. Can we stop there for a second? This is a lesson. For anybody who is watching this on video or in this room, the best time to start your business is when you work for somebody else. On their dime. On their dime. With their Ooh. copy machine. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you do not want to jump out the window uh -huh. and start your business and live off of your savings. And I'll get back into your story, but I hear this again and again. If you're thinking about starting a business, please stay where you are. It's more than eight hours in a day. Do your nine to five, get off and go to work. Back to you. But not only that, I'm just add to that. Um, like a lot of a lot of a lot of the time that you guys are at work, you're on Facebook, tw um, Twitter, Instagram. You're, you're talking to your peoples. All this time, you could also be building your business as well on the dime. So keep that in mind. So you're at Verizon. You buy one, two properties while there. I buy, yep. I start buying one or two properties while I'm there. Um, I, I, I had two properties in Queens. Uh -huh. Those were my first two properties. Um, as I said before, I, I had the gambling bug. So um, as quick as I, as quick as I, as good as I was at making it, I was also good at losing <laughs> you it. You were too. better at losing it? Exactly. <laughs> so um, I ended up getting, getting into um, some gambling debt. So I had to liquidate, liquidate properties to um, cover, cover my losses and stuff like that. So I, so I also had cash in my hand. So that's when I took the game to Brooklyn after that. After seeing that jogger run after, through your after, dice game. After seeing her run through my dice game. So you had the foresight to know this neighborhood is changing. Yeah. Before we get into your first property in Brooklyn, there's somebody in this audience right now, there's somebody who's watching this, who is thinking about buying their first property. Can you give somebody advice on what you learned from buying, and do you even remember your first property? I do. You do? I do. What was the process? Um, the funny thing about it, I, the first, the, my first property that I ever bought in Brooklyn, um, 162 Clifton Place, mm -hmm. still remember that. I paid $440,000 for it back in 2000, 2002. 
Okay. Um, it just got appraised for over three million the other day. You still own it? I still own it. Um, and that, you know, that was again trial by fire. Made every mistake um, in, in the book. Um, picked up that again. I picked up that property for about four hundred, for forty something like that. Before you go too far. Again, somebody is about to buy their first property. Okay. Where'd you get the money? Well, that that came that money came from um, residual from the the first property that I bought, and I also had purchased my um, the house that I was living in in um, in Rosedale, the craft house. You know, me and my that's another story. Me and a couple of my sons, we um, just like lived in this house. Um, so when when that property increased in value, I was able to take the equity out of that and start pushing into, into um, investment properties. Before we go too deep, because now we're about three houses in. Yeah. Again, many people want to get into real estate. How do you, you finance? You see all of these, you know, get rich quick schemes, no money down. Uh, FHA, this, if I am buying my first home, all right, my first home, maybe I work a nine to five and I don't have money saved up. Tell me how you bought your first home and what you learned and how somebody else now getting in the real estate game, what would you recommend to them if they don't have the money in the bank? Okay, I'm going to tell you exactly how I bought my first house. Uh -huh. um, as I said, I was I was getting my MBA at St. John's, so um, I was on a scholarship. But not only was I on a scholarship, um, Verizon had tuition reimbursement. So so basically, I was getting a nice check back from financial aid, and then I, on top of that, I was taking student loans out. So I basically had about twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars in my hand um, between working and and money that I got back from student. You know, from you know when you get your financial aid refund back. Mm -hmm. So I put that to the side after I bought the rims for my car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a little bit. I had a bit, a little bit left, and then um, I took that money and I got my, I got an FHA loan on the first property that I got. It was on 90th Avenue. Stop there. For anybody who doesn't know, what's an FHA loan? Um, a FHA loan is a um, federally subsidized, federally subsidized um, mortgage that you could put as little as three percent down. So basically, the property I think was about one hundred and ten thousand um, dollars, and I put three percent down. And by the time everything was said and done. Um, I was into my first home for about twelve thousand dollars out of my pocket, which I refinanced like maybe six months later and got got about forty back. Nice, you know. So, um, the so this FHA and before and I'm so sorry, mm -hmm. FHA. It's commonly known as first time home buyers. Um, no, it's it's the. Um, Federal Housing Authority or something like that. So you can get an FHA more than once? Um, you can't have it simultaneously. So if you if you ha have a FHA loan, you'd have to close that out before you can get another one. Got you. You know, but the scrutiny, the scrutiny behind it is is pretty deep. So you just have to, um, it has to be convincing that you're actually really going to live there. Okay, so if... Anyone is thinking about buying a property, apply for an FHA loan as low as 3% down. As low as 3%. But you have to convince the banks that you will be a resident of that property. The first time around, there's no convincing. It's pretty much they take you as, as your word. Okay. Um, but it's not just the FHA. There are, there are banks out there that, that give you, um, that let you put 5% down, 10% down. Um, as long as long as someone will cover the insurance, um, it's called PMI, um, and you could always take out a home equity loan or something to substantiate the down payment. So if if a bank really wants to twenty percent down, um, I think 
there are more than um, there, especially if you partner up with each other. There are there are there's full of options of how you can come up with the money that the. Uh, when you say partner up with, with with each other, what do you mean? So um, let's say I have cash, you have credit. Mm-hmm. You know, um, how about we sit down together and we put a package together where we could present to the bank together and. And even if it's my house or your house, we'll work that out amongst ourselves later. You know, um, that's our contacts are our biggest resource. Well, one of our biggest resources. I always say that there are four things that you need to purchase a home. You need collateral, you need contacts, you need character, and you need credit. You know, so those are the things that you that you need to put together so you can cop your first joint. Um, second joint, third joint, and, and so on. But um, if you have credit, but you don't have collateral, but your friend has collateral, um, and you have credit, there, there's always an opportunity for you guys to come together and 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 make something happen. Nice. We're jumping a little bit ahead. I want to go back for a second. Okay. You put three percent down on your first house, twelve thousand dollars. Yes. Well, it was less than it's three percent was less than that, but at the closing cost and all that other stuff, it, it basically ran me about twelve thousand dollars. About twelve thousand dollars. You spoke about having equity in the house and pulling it out about three months later, six months later. About six months later. Forty thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, because I I purchased a property below below market. Mm-hmm. So um, that's one of the practices that I've. Always, and I still, you know, I've never purchased anything at retail. So whenever I'm going into a property, I always make sure that there's equity built in. So if the property is worth one hundred fifty thousand dollars, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to pay no more than one hundred ten thousand dollars for it. You know, just in case there's a correction or in the market where where the prices come down, that I'm never underwater. Got you. What'd you do with the equity? Of uh, I bought the house next door. Really? Yeah. So um, I ended up getting the two houses right next to each other. So these, you're still in Queens at this point. I'm still in Queens. Nice. So you're moving now. I'm moving. I'm, I'm working at Verizon. I'm, I'm doing, um, I'm doing like 80 hours a week at Verizon. Just, just like building bank. Cause every time, every time I get enough for another down payment, I'm flipping that. I'm putting that into another property. When did you decide, I'll go a different way. When did you stop working at Verizon and why? Um, I stopped working at Verizon on, I think it's June 21st, 19, no, excuse me, 2005. June 21st, 2005. Yeah, I know that. Why do you remember that date? Because I have the termination letter on my my (laughs) wall. That's the day that they terminated me. So yeah. you were fired? I was basically, yeah. Why? Um, the truth? Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the, truth, the truth was I was, I was feeling myself. You know, I was feeling myself. I was, making, I was making money. I was making a lot more money doing real estate than I was working at Verizon. And um, I was letting my boss know it every, every chance I got. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, I remember... Um, true story. I remember he um, he had gotten like a, a C class, a C class Benz or something like that. And I, I came in one day with my um, I had like brand new CLK convertible, and I looked over at him. I was like, Do those things even got leather? <laughs> <laughs> you hit him with the Jay Z. Yeah. You What's know? the difference between a five point oh? <laughs> exactly. So. Um, you know, I was feeling myself, um, and but it was kind of, you know, I had outgrown the place anyway. And um, truth be told, if they never fired me, I'd probably still be there. Really? Day. Yeah, because it's easy money. It was easy money. You know, it was easy money. I wasn't, I wasn't working hard for it, but um, it's the best thing that they ever did to me it was to, to, to fire me. And truth be told, when they fired me, I sent everybody like a bottles of champagne, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, telling them thank you for everything that they, they've done to me, done for me. Um, even even the guy who fired me, I sent him a bottle. Okay, Jude, that was a boss move. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the, um, during that time, there was this property at 184 Madison Street that I was working on. Um, I was, I think I was making about $110,000 working at Verizon a year. And I ended up flipping that property. I, I Which property? The one on Madison? The, the one on Madison. While, you know, like, I had started the process while I was working at Verizon. And by the time I was fired and I flipped that property, uh, I think I made like $440,000 in like three or four months on that deal. And I was so nervous, you know, I was a little nervous about about um, losing my job, but here I am, you know, quadrupled my salary in three months. Three months. You know, so um, it, it showed me that there was life after Verizon, you know. You know, and again, for anybody who's in the room, I always recommend start a business while you are working at a business. But as fearful, listen to what he said. He's making more money at real estate, but he probably would have never left. It was easy money, and sometimes it is fearful to jump out there on your own. Becoming an entrepreneur, that, that that's scary. It is extremely scary because there's no net. You provide your own income, but you'll always know that it's time to leave. For any of you guys who are thinking about when do I leave, you leave when you either match or you exceed your salary. That's when you know I can do this. It's time for me to step out on my own. Yeah. Um, you know, the the funny thing is, like, listening to my mom, my mom has given me some of the best bad advice ever. It's the right? best bad advice? Exactly. <laughs> you know, like she know, you know, she knows motherly things, what to do, like in relationships and, and how to deal with people, but like real estate and business, like I started from now on, I will always do the opposite of everything she tells me. <laughs> and um, one of the things that she she was like, oh, you can't leave your ho- you can't leave your job because what are you gonna do for health insurance, right? What if you get sick? And that always stayed in the back of my mind. And I'm just like, but you know, as time reali- as time went on, I realized I could just buy health insurance. You know, um, like. So, so many of us like stay at work for the benefits. Oh, my 401k, I could just invest in the market. You know, like um, you have a lot more discretionary income. So you, there are a lot of more, there are a lot of other things you could afford to pay for. So you shouldn't feel shackled, you know, just because they're keeping a carrot in front of you, you know, that carrot. Um, I, I have a friend of mine, she works at a, um, at, at a uh, like a corporate job, and mm-hmm. like every year, every year they give her like one hundred fifty thousand dollars in stock, but it doesn't mature until the next year. So if she quits, she she doesn't, she, she doesn't get that. Yeah. So she stays. You know, she wants to leave, but she's like, oh, I'm gonna stay this year just to get this one hundred fifty thousand dollars in stock that they you know that I'm gonna get. And then next year when it comes, what do they do? They put another one hundred fifty thousand dollars in front of her. Right mm-hmm. now, she, you know, she's making big moves. Um, like she has, she has dough, and she has a great business plan, and she, he, she would do very well. But she can't, um, she can't get past that carrot. You know, like if she took her own money and invested it, she'd probably make make more than that. We're getting into, you said two thousand five, two thousand five exactly. I'm sure everybody remembers 2005 because we're starting to get into troubled waters in the U.S. economy, right? Yeah. So you're riding high. How many properties do you have at this time? Um, I probably, like between 2005 and 2008, when, you know, it hit the fan, I had about 12, 12 properties. You had 12 properties. Yeah. How many units? In those twelve properties, probably looking at about forty prop forty units. Okay, so you're doing good. Yeah, actually, no. Excuse me. Um, I had a um, at that time. I had I had two buildings in Baltimore. One it was a thirty six unit, and one was a six unit. So I had forty two units in Baltimore alone. So um, I probably had about eighty units. You had eighty units. Exactly. You're balling. Balling. I'm going hard. <laughs> Um, and I'm spending it too. 
<laughs> Is it, oh yeah? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm spending it. Uh, can, can, can we talk about that? Because you, you kind of treaded lightly into this gambling thing. And I love when I speak to successful people, again, you're only human. There's going to be some good, there's going to be some bad, there's going to be some vices. Sounds like your vice was gambling. It was really bad. As a matter of fact, I got a tattoo on my hand that says right here, never again, 12-13-04. So this is like the only thing that stopped me from gambling to this day. How bad did it get? uh, On this day, 12-13-04, I am at the Bellagio, um, sitting down. Vegas. Vegas. Um, so it's, I'm sitting right here. Sam Cassell is sitting right there. Um, they got NBA, the, exactly, Sam Cassell. They, they got the ropes behind us. Um, so start, started playing $1,000 a hand, you know. When were you playing? Blackjack. Okay. Um, by the end, you know, within, within a couple of hours, um, Sam Cassell, Who's probably making like millions is is playing five grand a hand. Um, so I start playing five grand a hand. <laughs> so uh, I ended up I ended up blowing I think about one hundred thirty thousand dollars in a twenty four hour period, and that's you know that was the day that I was just like all right I'm done. So I left there went to the um, tattoo parlor had this put on my hand. And I've never gambled again a day. Every time I get tempted, you know, um, I look at this, I'm like, oh, if I, if I gamble now, I'm lying to myself. So I can't do that. That's a great gem for everybody. That's a great gem. Congratulations. Thank you. That's a great gem. <laughs> Did you lose any of your properties that day? Nah. You didn't lose anything? Just, just equity. money? Just equity. Just equity. <laughs> OK. You know, because I was playing with equity lines. Got you. You know, uh, I didn't lose. Any, I didn't lose anything that day, um, but it put me in a bad place. You know, and the the thing about gambling is, like, you remember, like, I could tell you, I remember that hundred and thirty thousand dollar loss, right? But I I'll, I never remember like the day that I made. Um, I went to the casino and I made five thousand dollars, and then I went back the next day and gave fifteen back. You know, or the day I made I made seven. And then I went back the next day and lost 20. Mm-hmm. So those are the ones that that mess you up. And um, when you get when you have vices, you know, like even though you think you keep your vices and your business separated, um, it, it affects. Cause it, it affects your decision making. You know, it affects your, um, you know, the way the way you allocate your resources, all of that. So whether your vice or or um, whether your vice is, you know, drinking. Um, gambling, sex, smoking, whatever it is, you you just have to be conscious that you know you know, like things things are things have to be balanced. So if you do this over here, this is going to come down like this. Mm-hmm. So the only way to keep things even is just to keep things even. Got you. O five O eight, market takes a terrible crash, the worst recession since the Great Depression. How bad did it affect you? <laughs> Real bad. Um, so I had about, by, by 2010, out of the, out of the um, 12 properties that, no, out of the, the 11 properties that I, I had, um, 10 of them were in foreclosure. Really? Yeah. The only property that um, I made sure never got touched, no matter what, was you know was the house where my mom's was at? Uh, everything else, I just stopped paying the bills because I just didn't have it. So um, what I ended up doing around that time, because cash flow was really bad, I ended up. Um, let me let me take it back a second about how everything was falling apart. You know, um, like I had bought, you know, big big house in Jersey. You know, out in Englewood Cliffs. Your personal home. Personal home. Mm-hmm. Um, I had cars, watches. I used to throw parties. I used to, you know, it, it was nothing for me. I don't even drink like that, but I was going out two, two, three nights a week, dropping 1500 a night, you know, just because that was the thing to do because of people like you, <laughs> you know, selling the culture. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
you know, and I bought into it. So, um, but it was really, it was really bad. It was a really, um, I had to I actually had to kind of step away from real estate for a minute. What do you mean? Um, there was there was no money to be made in real estate. You know, um, the rents were low. Mm-hmm. Um, the banks weren't lending. The, um, the pro- um, property values were, were constantly decreasing, so there was no way to, um, to flip to make money. So um, there, were two, there were two strategies that I used for cash flow. Um, and the first, the first thing that I did was I looked at the um, depressed commercial real estate market. So um, the, there was a property, there was a, um, like a 3,000 square foot space um, on Broadway, Broadway and like um, in Third Street or whatever, um, wherever over there in, in Soho. And I basically rented that place for like $4,000 and I used to throw parties in there. So I did that, I did that for about a year before they shut me down uh, for cash. And the other thing that I did for cash while, you know, there was no money in real estate is I ended up going to India and um, getting a, a hair connect and I started importing um, Indian hair weaves. So, um, you know, I was doing that for like two, three years. You know, is there money in that? There was. Held you over? Hell, yeah, I did pretty well with that, you know. Um, so no matter how bad the economy is, women are going to do their hair. No, no <laughs> ma- two things. No matter how bad the economy is, people are going to party. So I provided space for that. And no matter how bad the economy is, women are going to do their hair. So I provided, you know, I provided that as well. You said the majority of your properties were in foreclosure. Yes. Did you lose any? Not, a, not one. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, I think that it's a, a, a lesson for anyone thinking about going into business. And I don't want to just gloss over it. No matter how well you're doing, I don't care if you are rolling in the dough. I always say in times of peace, you prepare for war because at any given moment, something that is completely unexpected can happen and can completely change your fortune. I remember myself, like all other business owners, 08, 09, 10, 11, those were difficult, difficult years that you just couldn't predict. But... It could be anything. So please, if you're in business, buckle down. Always make sure you have a reserve. Always make sure that you're thinking 10 steps in advance because anything can come and change the course of your good fortune. You said these homes were in foreclosure. You didn't lose any of them. You're not paying them. Educate me. How do you not lose a home and you're not paying on it? You fight. You know, you fight. You know, I, I did it. I did it all. Um, as I said, I, I had the, I had the hustles going on um, mm-hmm. with the hair and the event space. Um, I, I was Airbnb. I was Airbnb in my, my, my house and, and staying at, at a friend's house while people were living in my house. Um, you know, just paying lawyers, um, renegotiating with banks. Oh, the banks hate me. <laughs> you know, um, I've renegotiated. I probably um, renegotiated about three or four million dollars that I made banks eat. You know, like from modifications or or just making deals with them. Um, I had home equity lines of credit that went to collection agencies. As soon as it went to collection agencies, I'd, I'd wait a, like a month or two because they, first they'd call like, hey, give us, 50, give us 60% of the money, give us, give us 40%, give us 30%. Um, I had this one, I had, a, um, I had a home equity line of credit that they sent to a collection agency 
that um, I owed them like a million dollars on it. And I ended up paying them just like a hundred thousand dollars to uh, to get the um, to get the them off get them off the lien. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically, basically I I ended up making nine hundred thousand dollars on that deal. Um, I had to pay tax on it. You know, no, excuse me. I had to show I had to show the income on tax, and you know, I, I'd expensed it other places and and paid the taxes of of whatever. But um, bottom line is. That's nine hundred thousand dollars in debt that I was able just to wash, just by you know negotiating, you know find you know f- writing hardship letters and 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 learning the system and stuff like that. What in? It's a great segue. What did you learn during that period as a real estate investor? Because one of the things that I want to get out, people look at you, your successful real estate mogul. But what are the do's and the don'ts? Like, like, I, I, I want to learn from you. I don't want to learn from my mistakes. Um, the funny thing about like this, it's it's ninety nine percent people skills. You know, um, your character. Like I said, the four things that you need are your um, your your credit, your collateral, um, your contacts, and your character. Two, the, everybody thinks about the credit and the collateral, but they don't really think about the contacts and and the, the character. You know, um, I've been in I've been in this game for like 23 years. You know, I'm very vocal. I'm out there. People see me, but not one person could ever say, "Hey, Jude lied to me about something, or Jude stole from me, or he he hoodwinked me, or did something funny." So um, I think the most important thing that you could do is is keep your word in this business, you know, um, because if your investors, you know, yeah, investors are your bread and butter, mm-hmm. you know, um, the people who cut the checks to you, like they have to know no matter what, you know, um, if the market tanks, Jude, Jude is going to make it right. Jude is going to stay up, you know, 20 hours a day working and, and, and he'll, he'll go to India and, and, and sell hair weaves. Um, to make sure that he comes through with the money. So um, that is, you know, like all the other stuff, all the other stuff is, you know, numbers and this and that, and you could kind of learn that. But the relationships that you build and the ability to um, to be true to your word no matter what. Like I've lost, you know, um, I've lost money on a deal and not t- and not tell my investor and hand him the money that I'm supposed to hand him in front, like like everything went well, you know? Like, yeah, it, it went good. See that? Here's your money. It's all good. And, and I take the L rather rather than me go to him and say, hey, um, sorry, it didn't work out. So you're going to take an L on this one because there's no forgiving that. Correct. People don't forgive that. People, don't, people, people will always remember that. I buy my first home, buy my second home. What is a hard money lender and what's the difference? Is it interest rates? Is it because a hard money lender sounds like it is some Italian guy who is yeah. in a, a sweatsuit who's going to break your kneecaps if you don't pay him his money? A strong word called consignment. <laughs> Not for freshmen, just for live men. You know, um, hard, money, hard money lending is exactly what it is. It's, it's, um, it basically comes down. Even though it may some some of them dress up like it's a real institution, it, it basically comes down to um, an, someone who has a lot of money who's lending it out for for a interest rate that is barely legal. So I don't know. Uh, I think the the usor, usury rate in New York State right now is sixteen percent. So um, hard money lenders lend anywhere from twelve to to fifteen point five percent right now so um, and the the process the process is not as taxing as the um, conventional side is basically hey Saul I have a deal can you do it can you help me out you know it's based on your relationships and stuff like that got you so a hard money lender I shouldn't look at them as an institution per se 
I should look at them as an individual or a group that has pulled together large um, sums of money. Yeah, you, you, you probably won't deal with that individual directly. You'll probably deal with one of their brokers that, that maneuvers for them. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's really, it's not, it's not like a bank or anything like that where, where they have strict guidelines. It's like, do they like you? Um, do they trust you? Um, I had a, I had a hard money guy um, that I that I met with, and you know we vibed and this that the other, and um, I called him up the next day. I was like, "Hey, you gonna give me the money?" He's like, "No." I was like, um, "Why not?" He's like, I don't, "You don't. You're not married, and you don't have kids. You could run." <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, "All right," um, but. He could say that, you know, he's, that, that's his own personal guideline. You know, like he had, he had this thing in his head. He just likes, he likes to lend to people that can't run, you know? Um, so Citibank won't, won't say stuff like that. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Envy sat in his seat several weeks ago. Yeah. And his philosophy was, I want to buy the worst house, I want heroin needles, I want the worst house on the block. But he's buying in bulk. He's buying in the worst neighborhoods. You have a different philosophy. You're dealing with more of a high-end clientele, million dollar homes, people who are high net worth, why don't you, go, because most people who get into real estate, especially from our communities, they see the value in, I'll get the cheapest house on the block, I'll put some people in there for section eight, I got the government paying a portion of the rent so I know I'm good. Why do you have a different philosophy on the homes that you buy? It's, it's a personal thing. Like I personally don't, don't want to deal with the the rigmarole that comes with um and I know this is I don't know how to say this so I don't sound like a snob or or or, or anything like this but um I would just rather deal with the person who's paying me four thousand dollars a month rent than deal with four people paying me one thousand dollar a month rent because there's just less contact with people less like things are less likely to break um less people that you're dealing with. And um, the, the $4,000 a month tenant is out there making sure that, that they're working to pay you your $4,000 as, as opposed to, um, you know, um, some, some, pe some other, some other um, people who might, I sound like an asshole saying this, but um, it's, it's, it's the truth. I'd, I'd just rather deal, I'd, I'd rather deal with big checks and, and, and big people problems than, than you know, dealing with evictions and landlord-tenant court and stuff like that. I just don't have time for it. It's, it's just, there's money in it, but it's just not, it's not my thing. You know, you know, is this something learned over time? Because, yeah. because yeah. I have to assume that you started yeah. on one end of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, and I was in landlord tenant court. I'm in section eight court. Um, um, like my checks not coming in because they didn't fill out their paperwork and, and things of that nature. And it's the, um, the percentages are good, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I'd rather I'd rather spend you know uh, like a million dollars, um, and and know that I could flip that for for you know two million or two million five, and or or I could keep that and and rent it out to somebody that's paying twelve thousand dollars a month rent, ten thousand dollars a month rent, or something like that. It just works better for me, with my with my personality because I just don't have I don't have the um, like when when I was chopping it up with Envy, and he told you he doesn't. The only time he sees his property is like when he buys it, uh, or when he sells it. And he, you know, he has his man that does does property management for him, so he doesn't have to deal with um, he doesn't have to deal with that. I I'm more hands on guy, you know. I know every one of my tenants by name. To this day. To this day, you know, like right now, I think I. 
Um, I currently have um, 14 units, um, and I have about four, yeah, about 40, about 40 tenants. I know every last one of them. You, and I'm going to switch subjects for a second, because I believe whenever you own your own business, whenever you work for yourself, there's a lot of personal sacrifices. Yeah. What are some of yours? Um, I don't get it. I don't get to vacation the way that I want to because there's always something going on. Um, it's, it's impossible. No, excuse me. I won't say impossible, but it's very difficult having, you know, personal relationships, you know, because there's always something going on. Um, it's like, it's hard to, um, decompress because, you know, like, like I have so many, so many things going on that, uh, my mind is always racing, you know? So while people are partying, I might be there, but I'm not there. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm just like, Hmm, did the, did the plumber close the, close the door and stuff like that? So, um, but there's always a sacrifice, right? Um, like I have friends of mine that, that envy my portfolio, right? And that I'm at dinner with them and they're telling me, oh, wow, yo, look, you know what I'm saying? Wow, all that money, all that this, that, the other, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, and I'm over there saying that, wow, I envy his life, you know? You know, he comes home, he has a wife, he has the kids, you know, come, he comes in the door, door kids run up, daddy, this, that, the other. Um, but, you know, 23 years ago, when, when I started, build, when, when I got on my journey towards real estate, he got on his journey towards family. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, there is balance there. There are people, there are people who have mastered balance, but typically, you know, people, um, People excel at one thing, and when you excel at one thing, other things fall. You know, so it's it's very there's sacrifices every day. No wife, no wife, no kids, no kids. So what's your legacy? I'm working on it. <laughs> you know, I'm working on it, which is why um, I I pretty much stopped taking deals. You know, I'm trying to, like right now, I'm trying to wrap up. I have three deals, three projects that's going on simultaneously right now. I have three $4 million projects going on at the same time. And um, hopefully by September, I, I could be done with that. And the plan is to just kind of coast. And I won't say that I'm going to retire, but um, I know that I'm going to, that I'm going to focus more on, on family, you know, you know, um, my, my parents are getting a little older, so I am um, working on, you know, making, making sure that these days are going to be memorable for, for myself and them. In, and just getting back to real estate, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you're shooting dice, Caucasian woman runs past your dice game. Curves to you, Brooklyn is, it's next. I need to invest in my backyard. If I'm getting into real estate today, what should I be looking for to figure out what is the next Brooklyn? What's the next Bronx? What's the next Newark? What are some tips that you can give to people to figure out where they should be placing their bet and investing? What I always tell people is to pay attention, right? Uh, pay attention to things like infrastructure, where the train's going. Um, not necessarily in Brooklyn, but anywhere. You know, like where, where, where does do the cities have to um, plans on expanding trains and and where are they building hospitals and things of that nature? Where is like when I first started started in the game, I used to use the Starbucks test. Right, because I didn't have I didn't have money for marketing and excuse me marketing research. So what I used to do was um, I, I'd find out where Starbucks was coming up, mm -hmm. you know, 
And because back in the day, like before Starbucks was even in the hood hood, Starbucks, you know, used to do all these kinds of marketing uh, research to, to figure out the demographics of neighborhoods and stuff like that. So, so if there was a Starbucks there, I knew even if um, the, the neighborhood wasn't where, where it was, the fact that Starbucks was there, I knew that um, as long as I was in, in a half mile radius of that, I was good, you know? So the thing is you have to look for signs, you know, like, um, when, um, like when the Barclays Center was coming down here, um, that was a sign, you know? Um, like right now, and if you could look at East Flatbush, you know, Brooklyn College is expanding. You know, Brooklyn College is expanding. Um, a lot of, of big stores are going down there. So um, subsequently, the, the value of the real estate has, has gone up a lot over there. So it's, it's just a matter of paying attention. Pay attention to the politics, to the infrastructure, to the, um, to the commercial tenants that are coming there. Um, the people, you know, the people in the neighborhood, you know, you have to just be aware. Um, like there's never going to be a sign that, that says things are changing, you know, by now, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, but like when, like when I, when I was, um, when I was coming in the game, um, like, like downtown Brooklyn, um, Brooklyn Heights was like ground zero. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's Brooklyn Heights. So if, if the properties at Brooklyn Heights in Brooklyn Heights were a million dollars, that meant the properties in um, in Burham Hill was like a million five. That means that the properties in Fort Greene were two million. That means the properties in in Clinton Hills were two million five. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I said that wrong. If uh, if it was one million in um, if it was one million in uh, Brooklyn Heights, that means Bourne Hill was like seven fifty. That meant um, Fort Greene was like six hundred. That meant um, Clinton Hills was was five hundred. So guess what? I'm gonna buy I'm gonna buy in um, in Bed Stuy, which is in the outskirts of that. So. Um, as people get pushed out of the people who really wanted to be in um, in in um, what do you call it Brooklyn Heights, they're gonna go to Borough Hill, and and then they're gonna go to um, Fort Greene, and then they're gonna go to Clinton Hills, and then they're gonna go to Bed Stuy. So I bought heavy in Bed Stuy, you know. I bought I bought properties in Bed Stuy for like four hundred thousand dollars when um, people were trying to buy properties in in Fort Greene. For, for like 750, 800, all right? So I got, you know, w one train stop away, saved me like $400,000. So now, although, although the properties, the properties in, in Fort Greene are like four and five million dollars right now, um, the, pr the same properties that I bought in Bed-Stuy for like 400,000 are now like worth 2.5, you know? And it's shifting. You Can know, you give me a tip? Where, where, where should I be buying? <laughs> you know, um, like right now, um, East New York is hot. Um, but I got to believe all of Brooklyn is, it, it's overpriced no matter how you look at it. It's overpriced. Do yeah. you buy out of state? No. You don't buy out of state? I used to. But I know you because you mentioned Baltimore. I had Baltimore. I had Albany. I had, I had Miami. I had all of that. But um, again, like... As I said before, like my peace of mind, you know, because it was just too much for me. Like there's money out of state. You know, a friend of mine just told me about a um, like a 40 unit building in Dallas, Texas for like a million dollars right now. You know, so there's there's definitely opportunities that um, that truth, truth be told, um, New York City is like the worst place to, to put your money in real estate right now. Because uh, it's gonna cost you a million, like a typical property in in um, in Brooklyn right now. Uh, I think the um, the average price of a of a um, home in Brooklyn is is eight hundred thousand dollars. So to put twenty percent down on that is like one hundred sixty thousand dollars, right? So you put that one hundred sixty thousand dollars to buy to buy that um, that that house in 
that house in um, East Flatbush right now, you're gonna probably make like if you if if you make if you're not just breaking even, you'll probably just make a couple hundred bucks on that. But if you take that same hundred sixty thousand dollars, you could you could buy stuff in Baltimore, you could buy stuff um, in Newark, and all that other uh, all those other undeveloped places, and you'll get a, a bigger return on that hundred sixty thousand dollars. Could might make you, you know, two thousand dollars a month. You spoke early in the conversation about pulling money out of your first property to buy your second property. Most people don't want to live in debt, but Debt is a big part of the real estate game yeah. because you're constantly pulling money from one property to help buy the next property so that you don't have to come up with money out of your pocket. For you, do, you know, do you recommend people who are in the real estate business, when do you recommend they pull money out of the equity of their home? Or is the goal to pay these houses off and then go to the next one? It's it's a personal decision. But myself, um, so long as so long as everything is cash positive. So if if I have um, if I have a property that would would with a couple hundred thousand dollars in equity in it, and I could take the equity out of there. And I could take the equity out of there, but and that property will still be able to sustain itself. And then I take this this couple hundred thousand dollars and I put it over here, and this couple hundred thousand dollars now makes me another another couple hundred thousand dollars on the spot. It makes sense, you know. And the the thing is, property, you know, typically typically property goes up um, over over like like a 30 year span, right? Property goes up 3% a year. So the more if if you have all your if if you have all your equity in this property, you're getting 3% annually 3% growth on this property. But suppose you took your your money and took it out of here and you put it and you spread it into three different properties. So now you're getting 3% on all these properties. So that's understood. That that's something that most people don't don't really understand because the the more property even 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 though you have the same amount of debt or or maybe even more debt but your your net worth is growing appreciating at a at a greater greater percentage because instead of just you know one three percent you're getting you know three or four of them just in the interest of time got a few more questions for you you appear to hold on to your properties. Do you ever flip? I do. You do? Yeah. How do you make the decision to hold on versus an investment property to flip? Um, every house that I build, I always say, oh, I'm keeping this one. And then somebody comes with a bag. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, every prop, you know, um, the way that I... The way that I build, I build kind of out of love. So I, I do everything top notch. Um, I change things that most developers don't do and stuff like that. It's, it's, like, it's like artwork for me. It's like a science project for me, something that I enjoy. So um, every, every one of my, you know, um, over the last five years, every property that I've sold has always sold for the, at, at, the, um, at a record. You know, um, I sold, I sold a property on Washington Avenue, record sale. Halsey, record sale. Um, I'm in contract right now for a property on Van Buren. You know, it's, it's going to be the highest sale on the block. You know, so I typically, I typically like to keep properties. Um, but if, you know, somebody comes over and says, yo, I, here's, a, here's a million and a half for you. That, that you walk away with a million and a half profit, and then I, there's another deal out there and that I see the opportunity to take that million and a half and turn that into to three million. I'd be like, all right, I'm over this. I'll let it go. <laughs> Talk to me, the Brooklyn Bank. The Brooklyn Bank, um, that's, that is like my passion project. You know, um, 
that is that is like my opportunity to not be an asshole because you got to kind of be an asshole um, on the real estate side. But um, the Brooklyn Bank is a uh, a nonprofit that I started to create to um, empower people and 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 promote financial literacy and economic um, economic freedom. Um, it is. I purchased the building um, back in 2016, and I use it. I use it basically to hold events like financial literacy events and things of that nature. Um, I also use it as a event space um, for for community affairs, community stuff. And it's it's my it's my give back, you know. Um, it's it's something that I do for like my people because mm-hmm. unfortunately like when I'm selling four million dollar brownstone, brownstones I don't get too many of my people who, who buy it buy from me so it's like a good opportunity for that balance so give me an idea of some of the events or some of the things that the Brooklyn Bank gives back to the community um, well this past this past Saturday what we did is we um, we did taxes you know, we did taxes for people in the neighborhood. You know, anybody who was making less than fifty thousand dollars a year didn't have to go to H and R Block. You, we had some tax professionals come in. That's great. And, um, and they did your taxes. Um, and for MLK, for MLK Day, you were a part of that. We did mm-hmm. our annual uh, financial. Liter- no, what did we do? Not financial liter- literacy. We did entrepreneurship and real estate, where we we put a a panel together and we had a couple hundred people come out and um, learn about different different forms of, of wealth building. Mm-hmm. Um, I've hosted I've hosted events where I did a, a, a deal breakdown. Um, I, I did a deal last year where I walked away with like five hundred thousand dollars in about three three months three months worth of work. And what I did was um, I invited, I think we had like over 300 people in there that day. Um, and we went line for line of everything that I did from, from, um, surveying the property to, to, um, fixing it, to refinancing, to actually walking away. And I showed the check and just, you know, just to let people know that it's real and it's sustainable and it can be done. It's not, it's not magic. It's not hocus pocus. It's not, you know, um, it's, it's not, it's not a mystery. So those are kind of things, and we also do community stuff. You know, give, give, um, give um, meals out for um, Thanksgiving, toys out for for Christmas. Um, during Easter time, we do a, a a family portrait thing where you know we have professional photographers that'll set set you up, and you bring your family in, and um, you know you get a portrait. You know, so. That was a great. That was a great give back to the community. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. That was a great give back. Um, but um, the truth be told, you know, you you can't you can't get without giving, you know, and that's one of the things that I think um, in this industry that people don't don't realize that um, you are constant that you are constantly um, Taking, but the energy, you know, you're, you're taking this property and you're taking this rent and you're taking this flip. But if you're if you're not giving it, if you're not putting it back out into the universe to recycle, it dies. So that's a really great gem, and we'll leave you guys on that because I'm a firm believer that the reason I have is because I give, um, and I'm a man of faith and. You know, the Bible says, be a cheerful giver. And I truly believe the more you give, you know, you say the universe, I believe that that God himself, he's going to give back. So he's going to bless you. A couple of last questions. What's the best advice you ever received? Um, Think think in, uh, in dollars, not percentages. Think in dollars, not in percentages. Exactly. I'm not as smart as you. Break okay. that down. Um, if if you do a deal, if you do a deal um, and you put a thousand dollars in, 
and and you got twenty five percent, you get you get two hundred and fifty dollars, right? Uh -huh. um, if you do a if you do a deal for a hundred thousand dollars and you get ten percent, you get ten thousand dollars. Gotcha. So um, like it's. Like sometimes we, um, you know, we want to get gas. Like, yeah, I did thirty percent on this deal. I only, I only put X amount of dollars out, and this, that, the other, and I, and this was the return. I was like, yeah, but you can't spend, you, you can't spend percentages. You can spend dollars. Understood. So, so. What's the worst advice you ever received? Um, from my mother. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> Again, um, she told me, she said, you don't want to, when I told her I was buying um, in downtown Brooklyn, um, she said, you should, you should buy in Canarsie instead because there's more West Indian people there and, you know, they're better people. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's just, you know, and, and I was just like, yeah, Ma, <laughs> stop it. Looking back, what advice would you give to your 21-year-old self? Stop gambling. <laughs> Stop gambling early? Exactly. Don't gamble. Don't pick up them dice. Give it up for this week's Power Move Makeup, Mr. Drew Bernard. Thank you, brother. Oh, brother. You did great. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Got What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.